Welcome back. So, today they said that learning the rules of chess can only take a minute or two. Let's try that theory. Let's find out just how long it takes to learn the U.S. Chess Federation rules of chess. Okay, let me start first from the more basic rule set that we probably know, love, and all, are all familiar with, uh, the FIDE Laws of Chess, which was recently updated this year. This is actually a very simple, straightforward um, book. In fact, it's, an, it's published online. I got the wrong edition of this. Let me go back. Let me find the one that is the current edition of the FIDE Laws of Chess. All right, these are pretty simple and straightforward. We're going to, um, for purposes of learning the U.S. Chess Federation rules, we're going to first learn the international rule set because I believe these are a lot simpler to follow. And um, but without further ado, let's get to it. Oh, let's get the preface while we're at it. All right, cover over the board play. So this does not cover online play. This is just over-the-board play. Let me see if I can increase the text size so we can all read this together. English text is the authentic version of the Laws of Chess, which was adopted in the 79th FIDE Congress in Dresden, November 2008, coming into force in July 2009. In these laws, the words he, him, and his include she and her. So ignore that distinction. It says that um, it's just saying don't pay particular attention to um, gender pronouns for purposes of understanding the chess rules. The laws of chess cannot cover all possible situations that may arise during a game, nor can they regulate all administrative questions. Where cases are not precisely regulated by an article of the laws, it should be possible to reach a correct decision by studying analogous situations which were discussed in the laws. The laws assume that arbiters have the necessary competence, sound judgment, and absolute objectivity. Too detailed a rule may deprive the arbiter of his freedom of judgment and thus prevent him from finding the solution to a problem dictated by fairness, logic, and special factors. Yet we're studying the rules of chess here. We're going to get this right. It only takes a minute or two. Uh, FIDE appeals to all chess players and federations to accept this perspective. That seems like a reasonable preface for trying to understand the rules of chess for tournament play and match play and over-the-board play. A member federation is free to introduce more detailed rules provided that they do not conflict with the FIDE official laws of chess, are limited to the territory of the federation concerned, and are not valid for any FIDE match championship or qualifying event or FIDE title or rating tournament. All right, so basic rules of play, the nature and objective of the game of chess. The game of chess is played between two opponents who move their pieces alternately on a square board called a chess board. The player with the white pieces connect, uh, commences the game. A player is said to have the move when his opponent's move has been made. The objective of each player is to place the opponent's king under attack in such a way that the opponent has no legal move. The player who achieves this goal is said to have checkmated the opponent's king and to have won the game, leaving one's own king under attack, exposing one's own king to attack, and capturing the opponent's king are not allowed. The opponent whose king has been checkmated has lost the game. Um, I could probably use some commas, but that's okay. If the position is such that neither player can possibly checkmate, the game is drawn. The initial position of the pieces on the chessboard. The chessboard is composed of an 8x8 grid of 64 equal squares alternately light and dark. The chessboard is placed between the players. <laughs> they have to specify it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well, I guess it's a good thing that they specified this, right? It's placed between the players in such a way that the corner square to the right 
of the player is a light square or a white square. At the beginning of the game, one player has 16 light colored pieces, the white pieces. The other has 16 dark colored pieces, the black pieces. These pieces are a white king, white queen, two white rooks, two white bishops, two white knights, eight white pawns, a black king, a black queen, two black rooks, two black bishops, two black knights, and eight black pawns, indicated by those symbols. And the initial position of the pieces on the chessboard is as follows. Um, interesting that they used a picture for this. I wonder if there's a braille edition of the rules for people who play blindfold or people who are blind, rather. That's what I meant to say. Um, the eight vertical columns of squares are called files. The eight horizontal rows of squares are called ranks. A straight line of squares of the are of same color running from one edge of the board to an adjacent edge is called a diagonal. The moves of the pieces. It is not permitted to move a piece to a square occupied by a piece of the same color. If a piece moves to a square occupied by an opponent's piece, the latter is captured and removed from the chessboard as part of the same move. A piece is said to attack an opponent's piece if the piece could make a capture on that square according to the articles 3.2 to 3.8. Um, yeah. A piece is considered to attack a square even if a piece is constrained from moving to that square because then it would leave or place the king under of its own color under attack. Um, the bishop may move to any square along the di di diagonal on which it stands. Rook may move to any square along the file or rank on which it stands. A queen may move to any square along the file rank or diagonal on which it stands. You know? Um, I hope they cover this in more detail, because so far that doesn't seem right. Um, usually, you know, if there's like other pieces in the way, the bishop can't go to any square on the diagonal. It can only go as far as that piece, and if it's a friendly piece, it even can't even go that far. But hopefully they'll clarify that. It'd be a shame to get these rules wrong. Uh, okay, three about five. When making these moves. The bishop, rook, or queen may not move over any intervening pieces. Okay, that's good. The knight may move to one of the squares nearest to that on which it stands, but not on the same rank, file, or diagonal. Wow! So that's how you describe the L shape. You can move to one of the squares nearest to that on which it stands that is not on the same rank, file, or diagonal. So see, it's in the same 2x2 two two box, but not on the same rank, not on the same file, and not on the same color square. Or, yeah. Interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's easy to get these rules mistaken. It's important to properly parse them and look at examples. The pawn may move forward to the unoccupied square immediately in front of it on the same file, or on its first move, each pawn may move according to that, or may alternatively advance two squares. Or, the pawn may move to a square occupied by an opponent's piece, which is diagonally in front of it on an adjacent file capturing the piece. Or, uh, the en passant rule, which I'm not even going to... Well, let's try it. Upon attacking a square, crossed by an opponent's pawn, which has advanced two squares in one move from its original square, may capture the opponent's pawn as though the latter had only moved forward one square. This capture is only legal on the move following this advance and is called an en passant capture, meaning in passing. When a pawn reaches the rank furthest from its starting position, it must then be exchanged as part of the same move on the same square for a new queen, rook, bishop, or knight of the same color. The player's choice is not restricted to pieces that have been captured previously. This exchange of a pawn for another piece is called promotion and the effect of the new piece is immediate. There are two different ways of moving the king. Uh, by moving to any adjoining square, um, not attacked by one or more of the opponent's pieces. Or by castling. This uh, is a move of the king and either rook of the same color along the player's first rank. Counting as a single move and executed as follows 
the king is transferred from its original square to king two squares towards the rook on the original square. Then that rook is transferred to the square the king had just crossed. Um, note, if you're playing chess 960, the king goes to c1 or to g1, irrespective of its starting square, um, and the rook goes to d1 or f1 respectively, and so on for black. Um, the right to castle has been lost if the king had previous or already moved, or if the rook um, has already moved, you cannot castle with that rook. Castling is temporarily prevented, A, if the square on which the king stands, or the square in which it must cross, or the square in which it is to occupy is attacked by one or more of the opponent's pieces, or if there is a piece, any piece between the king and the rook with which castling is to be affected. The king is said to be in check if it is attacked by one or more of the opponent's pieces, even if such pieces are constrained from moving to that square because then they would uh, leave or place their own king in check. No piece can be moved that would expose either expose the king uh, of the same color to check, or that would leave the king that king in check. Okay, Article 4, the act of moving the pieces. Each move must be made with one hand only. Um, so, yeah, people with physical disabilities do have exceptions to these rules. Um, there are examples, but this is a general principle for your typical chess player. You would move the pieces with the hand, uh, with one hand only, if you're capable of doing so. Um, provided that he first expresses his intention, the player having the move may adjust one or more pieces on their squares. Except as provided by Article 4.2, if the player having the move deliberately touches a piece on the chessboard, one, if he deliberately touches one or more of their chess pieces, he must move the first piece touched, which can be moved. If he touches one or more of the opponent's pieces, he must capture the first piece touched, which can be captured. If he touches one piece of each color, he must capture the opponent's piece with his piece, or if this is illegal, move or capture the first piece touched, which can be moved or captured. If it is unclear whether the player's own piece or his opponent's was touched first, the player's own piece shall be considered to have been touched before his opponent's. Interesting. Uh, I wonder how they enforce that. You really need an impartial observer to be able to determine what got touched first. But in any event, touch move is, does suck for the player um, who, who it's called upon. If a player having the move deliberately touches the king and rook, he must castle if it is legal to do so. Um, that's curious. So we saw rule 4.1 here. Each move must be made with one hand only. Um, I mean, I guess it's possible to touch both the king and the rook. Touching the king and the queenside rook at the same time would be kind of challenging. Um, maybe single-handedly you could touch the king and the kingside rook. Um, yeah, I don't know how that would work. This rule might be dated. If they deliberately touch a rule and then, or deliberately touch a rook and then the king, you're not allowed to castle on that side, and the move should be. Uh, and the situation should be governed as 4.3a, that the rook must move. If a player having the move intending to castle touches the king, or king and rook at the same time but castling is illegal, the player must make another legal move with the king, or if the king has no legal move, the player is free to make any legal move. I did not know that. I would have assumed that if you touched um, both the king and the rook, with the intent of making a castling move, or if you actually did make a castling move, and it turns out that you couldn't castle, and then it further turns out that your king couldn't move at all, um, I had assumed that the rook would have to move, but that's incorrect. Uh, you're free to make any legal move in that circumstance. Um, interesting. If the player promotes a pawn, the choice of the piece is finalized when the uh, piece has touched the square of promotion. So not when you pick up a piece out of the box or off the side of the board, but once it 
strikes the square uh, where the promotion occurred. That uh, concludes uh, the decision of which piece you're promoting to. So theoretically, if you pick up a queen and you almost touch the square, and then you realize, wait, I actually want a rook or I want a knight or something, as long as you didn't touch the square. Okay, it's important to get these rules right, because, you know, they tell me it only takes a minute or two and that these save a lot of headache. I'm not so sold on the minute or two thing. And the, these are the international rules. These are not the U.S. Chess Federation rules. We're going to get to USCF rules once we get done with the international rules. Again, because I think these are a lot easier. 4-5. If none of the pieces touched can be moved or captured, the player may make any legal move. When, as a legal move or as part of a legal move, a piece has been released on a square. It cannot be moved to another square on this move. This move is considered to have been made, A, in the case of a capture, when the captured piece has been removed from the chessboard, and the player, having placed his own piece on its new square, has released the capturing piece from his hand. What? Huh? Wait. What? Why would you specify that? We just got through, um, like, a legal move, a piece has been released on a square, cannot be moved to another square. Oh, I see, I see. So, if you capture a piece and you remove another piece from the board in making this capture, again, bearing in mind that moves are made with a single hand, so it's quite difficult to lift up another piece, but not... Um, I'm sorry, if you have the piece and you've not released it. Okay. I see, that's the distinction that we're trying to make here. Um, so, if you've not released the piece that you are about to, um, to finish moving, and you decide, you know, I don't want to capture that pawn, or I don't want to capture this, that, or the other after all, you can set it back down on the board, but um, what does that mean? Uh, if he touches one piece of each color, he must capture the opponent's piece with his piece. Or, if, yeah. So, okay. So if you touch the opponent's piece, you must capture it. But the move is not said to have been made until after you've released the piece that you are capturing. So you can't change your mind about what move you're making, but the move has not been executed um, until the capturing piece has been released. Um, Oh, and the captured piece must be removed from the chessboard. So if you're in a frantic time scramble and you're about to play this checkmating move, um, one way to play that would be to um, move your piece, collect the opponent's piece, throw it off the chessboard, remove it from the chessboard, um, you might not have time to strike the clock. This might be your final move. But as long as the opponent's piece is not on the board, if it's been removed from the board, then that counts. Wait, what does removed from the chessboard mean in this context? Does it mean removed from the 2D space on the board? Or does it mean having been lifted off the board? I have to assume the latter. That if the piece is not standing on the board anymore so yeah you don't no need for theatrics you just need to make your move have your capturing piece land on the correct square and lift the opponent's piece off of that square and off of the board you can't just have that opponent's piece still on the board and that would have completed the execution of a move in the case of castling, when the player's hand has released the rook on the square previously crossed by the king, uh, that indicates completion of the castling move. Um, the player's released the king from the hand. The move is not yet made, 
but the player has no longer has the right to make any move other than castling, assuming the castling move is indeed legal. In the case of promotion of a pawn, when the pawn has been removed from the chessboard and the player's hand is released the new piece after... Pl oh, okay. You have to release the piece for the move to be completed. Um, but note that, again, uh, having your piece touch the promotion square um, finalizes your decision about what piece you're promoting to, but the move is not made until you release the piece that you've placed. If the player has released for the pawn has reached the promotion square, the move is not yet made, but you cannot play the pawn to a different square, such as pawn takes on a different square or pawn promoting on a different square. The move is called legal when all the relevant requirements of Article 3 have been fulfilled. If the move is illegal, another move shall be made as indicated by Article 4.5. A player forfeits his right to a claim against his opponent's violation of Article 4 once he deliberately touches a piece. So if your opponent broke the rule um, and you touch a piece and then you decide, oh wait, my opponent broke a rule, I'm going to call them on Article 4, you can't do that anymore once you've touched a piece um, deliberately. So if you're in some frantic time scramble and your opponent makes an illegal move, you cannot touch your pieces deliberately. You must stop the clock and call them on that immediately. Um, conversely, angle shooting would be making an illegal move with the understanding that your opponent's hand is already hovering over their pieces and they might deliberately touch a piece. And that's poor form. Really, you should try to win chess on its merits, not on angle shooting, but it's a thing to consider. Um, completion of the game. The game is won by the player who's checkmated his opponent's king. This immediately ends the game, provided that the move producing the checkmate uh, position was a legal move. The game is won by the player whose opponent declares he resigns, immediately ending the game. The game is said to be drawn when the player to move has no legal move and this king is not in check. This game is said to end in stalemate, immediately ending the game, provided that the move producing the stalemate position was legal. The game is drawn when a position has arisen in which neither player can checkmate the opponent's king with any series of legal moves. Kind of making rule 5-2-A a little bit redundant. Um, just saying. But... Okay, and I guess in English it might read different than different language, so it's good that they're explicit about these things. This game is said to end in a dead position, immediately ending the game, provided that the move producing the position was legal. The game is drawn upon agreement between the two players during the game, immediately ending the game. Um, the game may be drawn if any identical position is about to appear or has appeared on the chessboard at least three times. That was a point of contention today, although that was under U.S. Chess Federation rules, but they have a very similar rule. Um, the game may be drawn if each player has made at least 50 consecutive moves without the movement of any pawn and without any capture. Chess clock means a clock with two time displays connected to each other in such a way that only one of them can run at one time. And they both run forwards. You know... They didn't mention that in the rules, but I think that that's kind of important to point out. Anyway, a uh, clock in the laws of chess means one and two time displays. Each display has a flag. Flag fall means the expiration of the allotted time of a player. I, I guess forwards is implied by common sense and the arbiters and, you know, all that stuff. There's no need for the rules to be so explicit. Um... Don't bring a trick clock to a tournament. It, it won't work, and if it does, um, you're going to get in big trouble for it. So don't do it. When using a chess clock, each player must make a minimum number of moves, or all moves, in the allotted period of time, and or maybe allocated an additional amount of time with each move. All these must be specified in advance of the start of the game. Uh, time saved by a player during one period is added to his time available for the next period, except in the time delay mode. During the time delay mode, players receive an additional allotted main thinking time. Each player also receives 
a fixed extra time with each move. The countdown of the main time only commences after the fixed time, what you and I would call the delay, uh, has expired. Provided the player stops his clock before the expiration of the fixed time, the main thinking time does not change, irrespective of the proportion of the fixed time used. That is, if you move during that delay time, you don't get extra time on your clock. Um, immediately after a flag falls, the requirements of Article 62A must be checked. Um, that you have to make all the moves within the given period of time. Before the start of the game, uh, the arbiter decides uh, where the chess clock is placed. At the time determined for the start of the game, the at the time determined for the start of the game, the clock of the player who has the white pieces is started. Any player who arrives at the chessboard after the start of the session shall lose the game. Thus, the default time is zero minutes. The rules of a competition may specify otherwise. If the rules of a competition specify a different default time, the following shall apply. If neither present is present, neither player is present initially, the player who has the white pieces shall lose all the time that elapses until he arrives, unless the rules of the competition specify or the arbiter decides otherwise. During the game, each player, having made his move on the chessboard, shall stop his own clock and start his opponent's clock player is, must always be allowed to stop his clock. His move is not considered to have been completed until he has done so, unless that move uh, was made ends the game. Uh, time making the move, the time between making move on the chessboard and stopping his own clock and starting his opponent's clock is regarded as a part of the time allotted to the player. A uh, player must stop his clock with the same hand as that was which he made his move. It is forbidden for a player to keep his finger on the button or hover over it. The players must handle the chess clock properly. It is forbidden to f punch it forcibly, pick it up, or knock it over. Improper clock handling shall be penalized in accordance with Article 13.4. If a player is unable to use the clock, an assistant who must be acceptable to the arbiter may be provided to the player to perform this operation. This clock shall be adjusted by the arbiter in an equitable manner. A flag is considered to have fallen when the arbiter observes the fact or when either player has made a valid claim to that effect. So this is how FIDE international rules work. U.S. rules are a bit different in that a player must call the flag, but in, under FIDE competition rules, the arbiter may also observe that um, and may make the flag claim. Except where one of the articles above applies, if a player does not complete the prescribed number of moves in the allotted time, the game is lost by the player. However, the game is drawn if the position is such that the opponent cannot checkmate the opponent's king by any possible series of legal moves. Those of you who have played on uh, free internet chess, um, sorry, on Lee Chess, uh, I was trying to explain what the name Lee Chess stood for. Um, it comes from Libre for free, so L I Chess, Lee Chess, uh, are very familiar with this rule that if the opponent, um, by any possible series of legal moves, however insane, can checkmate, uh, that counts as a victory for that opponent. Otherwise, it counts as a draw if there is if a checkmate cannot be constructed. Um, and that's common sense. Um, it might make a lot more sense over the board where um, well, I don't know, where we have things like an increment or a delay clock, and there's not this constant clock mashing going on. And again, these rules only apply to over-the-board chess. These don't apply to online chess. FIDE has a separate rule book for online chess. We're not going to go into that right now. Um, but yeah, this is common sense, that if a checkmate can be constructed and you've lost on time, you lose. Um, but if their checkmate cannot be constructed, you cannot lose. Um, anyway, 6.10. Any indication, every indication given by the clocks is considered to be conclusive in the absence of any evident defect. 
A chess clock with an evident defect shall be replaced. An arbiter shall replace the clock and use his best judgment when determining the times to be shown on the replacement chess clocks. If during a game it is found that the setting of either or both clocks was incorrect, either player or the arbiter shall stop the clocks immediately. The arbiter shall install the correct setting and adjust the times and move counter. He shall use the, his best judgment when determining the correct settings. If both flags have fallen and it is impossible to establish which flag fell first, then A, the game shall continue if it happens in any period except the last period. B, the game is drawn if it happens in the period of a game um, in which all remaining moves must be completed. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, in the period of a game. So, uh, yeah, so if, there, um, if you can resume the game, the game resumes. Otherwise, if both flags have fallen and the final game period has expired, um, the game is drawn. Um, uh, in the, if a game needs to be interrupted, the arbiter shall stop the clocks. A player may stop the clocks only in order to seek the arbiter's assistance. For example, when the promotion has taken place and the piece required is not available. Again, the preface to these rules stated that um, the arbiter sh has some leeway and apply their best judgment and such if something catastrophic is happening in the course of playing a chess game. 612B would apply that a player may stop the clock to seek the arbiter's assistance, after which 612A could apply if the arbiter agrees that something catastrophic is happening, yeah, stop the game, we're going to handle whatever it is. Um, otherwise, um, 612C, the arbiter shall decide when the game is to be restarted in either case. Um, restarted is a really strange choice of verbiage. Um, I think it means that the clock is to be restarted, not the game. That's pretty weird. I'm pretty sure that's not what they meant. I should probably actually notify my national federation so they can notify the international federation um, about this strange choice of verbiage because restarted uh, would imply resetting the board, but there's no way that that's what they meant. 612D. If a player stops the clocks in order to seek the arbiter's assistance, the arbiter shall determine if the player had any valid reason for doing so. If it's obvious the player had no valid reason for stopping the clocks. Wait, what? What? Um. That's interesting. Wait. Okay, so that's the international rule. So if under international rules, if it is obvious the player had no valid reason for stopping the clocks, the player shall be penalized. This is at the arbiter's discretion whether a penalty takes place is because it's at the arbiter's discretion whether or not it's obvious. So if you make an incorrect claim under international rules about a draw, um, then it's up to the arbiter's judgment as to whether that incorrectness was obviously incorrect. That's an interesting twist. Um, U.S. Chess Federation rules are a bit different. 6.13. If irregularity occurs and or the pieces uh, have to be restored in a previous position, the arbiter shall use his best judgment to determine the times to be shown on the clocks, and if necessary, adjust the move clock's move counter. Screens, monitors, or demo boards showing the current position on the chessboard, the moves and the number of moves made, the clocks, uh, which also show the number of moves, are allowed in the playing hall. However, the player may not make a claim relying solely on information shown in this manner. You have to use a score sheet if you're going to make uh, claims based on that sort of information, or you have to using the arbiter's best judgment and impartial witnesses which may be present, etc., etc., although that might be a USCF thing. I'm not sure if that's a FIDE thing. Regardless, just write down your damn moves. It doesn't take that much effort.
and you'll appreciate it. Um, if you're in fantastic time trouble, write something down. As long as it's like approaches something that looks like a move, that's good enough. Um, but no, really, do your best to try to take notation and try to take it accurately, even in time pressure. But if you can't, at least write something. Cause there's no rule about... I mean, there are rules about how moves are written. There aren't rules about how your handwriting has to look attempting to write those moves. Just that you have to be writing chess moves. Um, and I think there's rules about how um, you notate the moves, um, uh, either under your native language or under um, the uh, English notation. I could be mistaken. Regardless, if during a game it's found that the initial position of the pieces was incorrect, the game shall be cancelled and a new game played. If during a game it is found that the chessboard has been placed contrary to Article 2.1, the game continues, but the position reached must be transferred to a correctly placed chessboard. Practically speaking, you both have the move list in front of you, you both know the position. Um, when they say transfer to a correctly placed chessboard, they're probably just talking about we're going to rotate the board and make sure you have the pieces set up right. Assuming both players have taken good notation. And that's not too hard to verify, but also FIDE tournaments, there are the tournament, or I'm sorry, the FIDE arbiters uh, who are present tend to be well prepared and tend to prepare extra boards. So they'd probably transfer it to a correctly placed chessboard as suggested here, unless there was some reason that couldn't be done and and or both players were amenable to just doing it on the same board but turning it correctly. Um, anyway, if a game's begun with colors reversed, then it shall continue unless the arbiter rules otherwise. If a player displaces one or more pieces, he shall reestablish the correct position on his own time and if necessary, either the player or his opponent shall stop the clocks and ask for the arbiter's assistance. The arbiter may penalize the player who displaced the pieces. Um, so there was an incident a couple rule a couple years back. Um, I think in a blitz game where one player had displaced a piece, and um, his opponent um, just struck the clock back and looked at him and suggested, you know, just position that piece correctly, would you please? But didn't say anything. Um, allowing the player to put the play pieces correctly on his own time. Um, I think this was under USCF rules, if I remember right. Um, under FIDE rules, uh, you would the arbiter would penal or may penalize the player who displaced the pieces. The arbiter would probably also be cool with what actually occurred in the USCF game. Um, just the opponent striking the clock and suggesting or looking at his opponent as if to say, um, put the piece like on the square where it belongs. You displaced a piece, it needs to be on the right square. But in general, players are pretty nice people. Um, general, they'll try to put the pieces on the correct square and not accidentally knock over pieces. But also, they there's some give and take. Um, I mean, yes, you can follow the rules to the letter. But if your opponent knocks over a piece and hits the clock in doing so, and, you know, both of you probably have time on your clocks, it's totally fine if it, you and your opponent feel like adjusting the pieces to replace them on the correct squares. Um, um, you don't need to be pedantic about the rules, although if you're playing in an international circuit or in a large tournament, it's best to follow the rules because these are the rules everybody can understand and the arbiter can enforce. Regardless, um, this is what the rule reads. And the arbiter, again, according to the preface, will apply um, the best judgment. Anyway, or their best judgment. Um, 7-4-A, if during a game is found an illegal move, including failing to meet the requirements of a promotion of a pawn or capturing the opponent's king, has been completed, the position immediately before the irregularity shall be reinstated. 
Um, let's see. If the position immediately before the irregularity cannot be determined, the game shall continue from the last identifiable position prior to the irregularity. Article sh or the clock shall be adjusted according to Article 6.13. The Articles 4.3 and 4.6 apply to the move, replacing the illegal move. The game shall continue from this reinstated position. So this is interesting. Um, wait, wasn't there a rule earlier about an illegal move? I could have sworn that um, you have to claim, oh no, no, I think it was the touch move rule. Um, yeah, you forfeit the right to claim touch move once you've touched a piece. So if your opponent does touch move, or they touch a piece with the intent to move it, um, you have to claim that before you try to make a move. Um. And hopefully there was a spectator to help you out. Um, and they're impartial, so the Arbiter trusts them. Or the Arbiter might have been watching the game. Um, okay, but yeah, if, uh, with regard to illegal moves, um, I guess we're back to irregularities down here. Position immediately before the irregular cannot be determined. The game shall continue from the last identifiable, identifiable position prior to the irregularity. So that is to say we'll go as far as we can on your score sheet and try to follow it, or however we can best identify a position that occurred prior to the irregularity. Um, that could be tricky, couldn't it? Um, after the action taken under 74A, for the first two illegal moves by a player, Arbido shall give two minutes extra time to the opponent for each instance. For a third illegal move by the same player, the Arbiter shall declare the game lost by this player. However, the game is drawn if the position is such that the opponent cannot checkmate the opponent's king by any possible series of legal moves. Um, yeah, there was a thing with Carlson the other a while ago, a number of months ago, and his opponent played an illegal move, um, and then Carlson made a move, and his uh, opponent tried to claim that um, Carlson didn't follow the rules. And these are the rules that got enforced, and I think the opponent just resigned. Uh, it was a weird situation. Seven five. If during game it's found that pieces have been displaced from their squares, the position before the irregularity shall be reinstated. Um, if the position immediately before the irregularity cannot be determined, the game shall continue from the last identifiable position prior to the irregularity. The game a clock shall be adjusted according to Article six thirteen. The game shall then continue from this reinstated position. Um, that's interesting. I'm going to assume that this is all consistent and that piece displacement is not something that happens very often. It doesn't happen often in my experience. And if I had a dispute, I could stop the clock and um, call an arbiter and get the penalty or whatever. Um, if a player displaces this, he shall reestablish the correct positions. And if necessary, the player or his opponent shall stop the clocks, asking for the arbiter's assistance. Um, so if you, like, knock over some bunch of the pieces, you can stop uh, the clocks and ask the arbiter's help in identifying that you're setting it up correctly or something. <clears throat> or the arbiter's help in regathering a piece that a spectator might have picked up and done something with or something, but in general the Arbiter shouldn't be needing to do anything other than make sure the rules are followed there, but if necessary you can ask the Arbiter's help. Um, um, but yeah, if pieces are displaced, um, the position before the irregularity shall be reinstated. Um, 
note, I mean, if you're in the middle of executing a move and you displace some pieces, um, you could probably put them back onto the correct squares before striking your clock. You probably don't need to undo your move, put all the pieces on the correct squares and then redo your move. Although that might be the courteous thing to do, I'm not sure. I think, generally speaking, if you've knocked over a piece like a bishop or a knight or something, um, both players know what square that piece came from. But technically, according to 7.5 here, you should put all the pieces back and then re-execute the move. Um, I guess that's the right way to do it. The recording of the moves. In the course of play, each player is required to record his own moves and those of his opponent in the correct manner, move after move, as clearly and as legibly as possible. I mean, that's kind of subjective. Yes, you're required to do so as clearly and as legibly as possible, but... Um, actually, they spelled legibly wrong, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, use algebraic notation. Um, on the score sheet that was provided. It's forbidden to write the moves in advance unless claiming a draw. Note with USDF and Monroy rules, it's much more confusing. But, um, yeah, under FIDE rules, if you're claiming a draw, according to Article 9.2, um, then you can write down the move that you intend to make as part of making that claim. I think you have to write it down before hitting the clock in that, or before uh, stopping the clock in that case. A player may reply to his opponent's move before recording it if he so wishes. M must record his previous move before making another. Uh, this is pretty frequent that a player will make a move and then write it down. Um, um, so. Yeah, you can write your opponent's move and your move um, but after having made your move. Um, you just cannot be more than one move out of sync with your score sheet. This rule, <laughs> I mean, some players, not so much in the international circuit, but national leagues or national federations, um, players may forget to write down their moves, but under international rules, you're required to write them down in standard algebraic notation. If a player is unable to keep score, an assistant who must be acceptable to the arbiter may be provided by the player to write the moves. His clock shall be adjusted by the arbiter in an equitable manner. That is to say, if you have an assistant, um, something equitable is going to be done on the clock. I don't even know how the arbiter figures that out. Um, probably deducting some number of minutes from your clock because you're not the one taking the notation. The score sheet shall be visible to the arbiter throughout the game. The score sheets are the property of the organizers of the event. <sighs> that bugs me. If I'm the one recording the moves and I'm the one playing the game, I should have, well, I guess I need to furnish my own score sheet for copying down the moves after the game should I want to have a copy of this. Because the score sheets are the property of the organizers of the event. Um, I know on occasions with um, US Chess Federation I've turned in copies instead of turning in the original. Here this is saying that I have to turn in the original. And if I guess if there happens to be a copy the um, they probably don't care. They just want the original. If a player has less than five minutes uh, his clock at some stage in a period and does not have additional time to, of 30 seconds, then for the remainder of that period he is not obliged to meet the requirements of keeping moves. Uh, immediately after one flag has fallen, he must update his score sheet completely before moving a piece on the chessboard. Um, Immediately after one flight has fallen, the player must update his score sheet completely. So, yeah, if there's no additional time, um, then if you have under five minutes, you don't have to take notation until um, 
the flag has fallen. Which is kind of confusing to me. Because, um, well, okay, now I guess that makes sense. Yeah, if a player doesn't know whether or not they've reached move 40 or move 45 or whatever the time control is, um, they wouldn't have a way to know that they have to start taking notation. So I guess that's why it's written the way it is. That you have to move until one of the flags has fallen. And then you have to update your score sheet completely before moving a piece on the chessboard. That seems fair and logical. If neither player is required to keep score under Article 8.4, the arbiter or an assistant should be should try to be present and keep score. Um, in this case, immediately after one flag has fallen, the arbiter shall stop the clocks and the both players shall update their score sheets using the arbiter's or the opponent's score sheet. If only one player is not required to keep score, he must, as soon as either flag has fallen, update his score sheet completely. Provided it's the player's move, he may use his opponent's score sheet but must return it before making a move. If no complete score sheet is available, the players must reconstruct the game on a second chessboard under the control of the arbiter or an assistant, first recording the actual game position, clock times, and number of moves made, if available, before reconstruction takes place. If the score sheets cannot be brought up to date, showing the player has overstepped the allotted time, the next move made shall be considered as part is the first of the following time period, unless there's evidence that shows more moves have been made. Um, that makes sense. At the conclusion of the game, both players shall sign both score sheets indicating the game result. Even if incorrect, the result shall stand unless the arbiter decides otherwise. The drawn game. Uh, rules of competition specify that players cannot agree to a draw whether in less than number of specified moves without the consent of the arbiter. If the rules of competition allow a draw agreement, the following apply. Um, so this is just about making a draw agreement. A player wishing to offer a draw shall do so after having made a move on the chessboard and before stopping his clock and starting the opponent's clock and offer it any other time is still a valid offer. But Article 12.6 must be considered um, we haven't gotten to 12.6, but um, basically it's saying, um, yeah, there's no conditions attached to the offer, and um, the offer remains intact until whenever, um, until after the opponent's next move. Uh, i have to look at 12.6 later, but it's probably nothing um, significant. No conditions can be attached to the offer. In both cases, the offer cannot be withdrawn and remains valid until the opponent accepts, rejects it orally, rejects it by touching a piece with the intention of moving or capturing it, or the game is concluded some other way. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's interesting. Wait, what? Oh, right. So, a player could offer a draw and then something unspeakably bad happens um, that just disqualifies the player from continuing the game, uh, which would conclude the game. Or both players could sign the score sheets with some result. Or, I mean, any number of other ways that the game could have ended um, will terminate the draw offer. That's funny. The offer of a draw shall be noted. Well, I guess, yeah, another way that it could end is uh, by the clock expiring. If you offer a draw and then forget to hit your clock, that would allow the game to end in a different way. Um, the offer draw shall be noted by each player on his score sheet with a symbol, the equal symbol. Um, claim of a draw under Article 9.2, or 10.2 shall be considered to be an offer of a draw as well. So if you make a draw claim and it's an incorrect draw claim, it's still a draw offer and your opponent may accept it, even if you were mistaken in making it. A game is drawn upon a correct claim of the player, 
having the move when the same position for at least the third time, not necessarily by move repetition, is about to appear. If first you write move on your score sheet and then declare to the arbiter your intention to make the move. Bear in mind you can stop the clock to do this too. Um, uh, to get the arbiter's attention and declare to them your intention to make the repetition. Or um, the repetition has appeared and the player claiming the draw has the move. They're considered the same. If the same player has the move, pieces are the same kind and color occupying the same squares, and the possible moves of all the pieces of both players are the same. Positions are not the same if a pawn that could have moved, captured en passant can no longer be captured in this manner. When a king or a rook is forced to move, it will lose its castling rights, if any, only after it has moved. So, I find that last rule more than a bit weird, um, but that is the rule. That, um, um, that suppose your king is in check, and you have no way to block the check. Theoretically, your king still has a right and an ability to castle until the king is moved. Whereas, uh, if you had an ability to block the check, you could have blocked it and then been able to castle. And the way this rule is written states that um, the castling right um, is only considered this, um, lost after um, the king or the rook is moved. So there is no differentiation between um, being in check and or whatever and um, electing to make a move that loses the castling right versus um, um, even if there was no legal castling move in the position if the castling right were possible, it's not considered the same. Which is kind of weird, but I guess it makes it easier for people to understand the rules, and it's pretty uncommon for players to have a castling right and then lose the castling right uh, and somehow end up in a threefold position with the king back on the square where the castling right used to be possible. It's, it's a corner case, and these rules are acceptable, although mathematically or logically it seems pretty weird to me that you have a castling right, um, but by moving you surrender it. Um, uh, or at least in my mind, if you are forced to surrender the castling right by virtue of either not having other legal moves or just like being in check and there's no way to capture the checking piece or interpose. I just find that more than a bit weird, but this keeps the rules nice and simple. And that threefold rule is not going to happen, basically. So the, these simple rules more than suffice. The game is drawn upon a correct claim of a player having the move. If he writes the move on a score sheet... Oh, right, we just went over that, right, didn't we? No. Oh, this is about 50 moves without progress. If you were on the move or declare the arbiter the intention to make the move, which will result in the last 50 moves having been made by each player, uh, there's 100 moves in total um, without the movement of any pawn and without any capture, or the last 50 consecutive moves have been made by each player without the movement of any pawn and without any capture. I find that a bit weird. Um, well, it just seems to me like if you can force, hmm, so there are, there are events, however rare, where it is possible to, um, declare that the opponent has no way to avoid the 50 move rule. And the opponent cannot win by uh, normal means. But proving that is kind of challenging. Um, but yeah, this is kind of a gray area. Like, 
Well, no, it's not. This is actually pretty straightforward. In the same way that the threefold rule is straightforward, even if you see that there's an unavoidable threefold, you have to actually play it, or you have to actually get to that position the third time. Here you have to get to the 50 move rule. Even if there's like this perpetual check, perpetual pursuit something, and the opponent has no way to make a pawn move or a capture before 50 moves by each player. Likewise, if there's a forced threefold, um, you could try to claim that the opponent's not trying to win by normal means, but that you're not going to succeed on that claim. Um, the Arbiter has no reason to give you the benefit of the doubt that you're going to find the threefold or that you're going to find the way to get past 50 moves. You have to actually have that occur on the board. Or you have to, your opponent had to have made 50 moves, you've made 49, and written down your 50th move. Anyway, if the player touches a piece, such as an Article 4-3, without having claimed the draw, loses the right to claim it on that move. Um, if the player claims the draw, Article 9-2 or 9-3, he may stop both clocks. He's not allowed to withdraw his claim. If the claim is found to be correct, the game is immediately drawn. If the claim is found to be incorrect, the Arbiter shall add three minutes to the opponent's remaining thinking time. I think under USCF rules it's two, here it's three. Interesting. The game continues that the claim was based on an intended move. This move must be made. Uh, the game is drawn when a position is reached from which a checkmate cannot occur by any possible series of legal moves, immediately ending the game, provided that the move producing the position was legal. A quick play finish is the face of a game when all the remaining moves must be played in a limited time. If the player having the move has uh, less than two minutes on his clock, he may claim a draw before his flag falls and summon the Arbiter. If the Arbiter agrees the opponent is making no effort to win by game by normal means, or that it is not possible to win by normal means, he shall declare the game drawn. Otherwise, he shall postpone the decision or reject the claim. So, I wonder if a quick play finish includes games where there's an increment. I th it doesn't say otherwise, so I guess if a player's under two minutes, things can get pretty wonky. If the Arbiter postpones his decision, the opponent may be awarded... Um, the opponent may be awarded two extra minutes and the game will continue, if possible, in the presence of an Arbiter. The Arbiter should then declare the final result later in the game, or as soon as possible, after a flag has fallen. He should declare the game drawn if he agrees that the final position cannot be won by normal means, or if the opponent was not making sufficient attempts to win by normal means. If the Arbiter has rejected the claim, the opponent shall be awarded two extra minutes time. The decision of the Arbiter shall be final regarding all those points. Unless announced in advance, a player who wins the game or wins by forfeit scores a point player who loses his game or score, uh, forfeit scores no points, and a player who draws his game shall score a half point. You know, that's pretty weird. Um, that's cool. You could theoretically have a tournament where um, an arbiter gives you three points for a loss, two for a draw, and one for a win. Nobody would do that because it's not... Um, well, I mean, you could do it, but you'd mess up the standings. But regardless, I guess this is just a way of formalizing this is how you record your results on the result sheet. Uh, players shall take no action. That will bring the game um, chess into disrepute. Players are not allowed to leave the playing venue. Um, that is defined by the playing area, restrooms, refreshment area, areas set aside for smoking, etc., Player having the move is not allowed to leave the playing area without the arbiter's permission. Um, interesting. Um, so if you have to use the restroom and it's your move, you need the arbiter's permission. That's kind of weird in my mind. I mean, it's one thing to say, like, okay, I suspect my player doing something weird. It's another to have it, like, embedded in the rule set that 
if it's your move, you can't use the restroom without the arbiter's permission. Anyway, uh, during play, the players are forbidden to make use of any notes, sources of information or advice, or analyze on another chessboard. Um, with, without the permission of the arbiter, players forbidden to have a mobile phone or other electronic means of communication in the playing venue unless they are completely switched off. If any such device produces a sound, the player shall lose the game. The opponent shall win. However, the opponent cannot win, so it's a draw. Smoking is prohibited or permitted only in the section designated by the arbiter. Uh, score sheet shall be used only for recording moves, times of the clocks, offers of a draw, and matters relating to a claim, and other relevant data. Uh, players who finish their game shall be considered to be spectators. It's forbidden to distract or annoy the opponent in any manner whatsoever. If unreasonable claims, unreasonable draw offers, or an introduction of a source of noise into the playing area. Um, but that is not limited to that. Infraction of these articles shall lead to penalties in accordance with 13.4. Persistent refusal by a player to comply with the laws of chess shall be penalized by loss of the game. Uh, arbiter shall decide the score of the opponent. Oh, that's interesting. So if a player refuses to abide by the rules of the game, even if the position's like a dead draw and the opponent has no way to win it, um, and one player refuses to comply with the laws of chess, such as completely refusing to take score, um, like write down the moves, um, they lose the game. And the arbiter chooses uh, the opponent's score um, using the best of their reasoning and knowledge, etc. If both players are found guilty according to 12.8, the game shall be declared lost by both players. In case of Article 10.2.D um, or Appendix D, a player may not appeal. So if you sign the score sheet or in Appendix D you've done something horrible, a player may not appeal against the decision of the Arbiter. Otherwise, a player may appeal against any decision of the Arbiter unless the rules of the competition specify otherwise. So those are the basic chess rules. There's all this additional stuff about the role of the Arbiter, and member federations may ask FIDE uh, to give an official decision. And there's reference for rapid play, and you don't have to write down the moves during rapid play. Um, illegal moves lose uh, the game or something like that. These are all FIDE rapid play rules. Again, for just over-the-board chess, not for online FIDE chess. Again, there's a supplement just for that. Here's um, 64 squares in case you're curious about them. Here's how you write the notation. Here's all the special symbols. Here's capturing en passant, except there's a little E at the end. I don't know why there's that E. That's okay. It's not mandatory to record the check, checkmate and capturing on the score sheet. So you don't need to put down the pluses. You don't need to put down that. You do need to put EP uh, or something that like resembles that to indicate this is an en passant move. You do need to put down castling. You know, so here's an example game. Um, uh, interesting. E4, E5, knight of three, knight of six, E4, D takes D4, E4, five, knight D, knight E4, queen takes D4, D5, E takes D6, en passant, knight takes D6, bishop G5, knight C6, eight, queen E3 plus three. Queen E3, check three. I'm thinking that's a typo. Um, bishop e7. Knight bd2, castle, castle, king e, or rook e8, king b1. Uh, draw offered. Uh, quick play when there's no arbiter present. Rules for the blind and visually handicapped. Um, so here's uh, Ella, Anna, Bella, Caesar, David, Ava. Felix, Gustav, and Hector. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, sechs, sieben, acht. Uh, yeah. 
the long castling and short castling. Wait, what? Really? Huh. I did not know this. This is pretty cool. Um, so, yeah. So instead of saying Hector 1, um, it's Hector 1. What the hell is this? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, and the rules for what's considered an executed move and so forth. If you find yourself playing against an opponent in this category, um, prepare the rules right before. Uh, uh, slip of the tongue in the announcement of move must be immediately corrected and before the clock of the opponent has started. Chess 960, oh, they, okay, here they do explain the castling rules for 960 and so forth, as I was talking about. Um, G side, yeah, king is on the G square. Yeah, yeah, this is what I was talking about. To avoid any misunderstanding, it may be useful to state I'm about to castle. Um, yeah, how do you actually execute the castling move? Because um, according to the other rules, you have to touch the king and then the rook. Well, what about positions where the. Yeah, I don't know. Um, where only the rook moves. That seems pretty weird. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of vague. And the arbiter will apply their best judgment, and that's okay. Guidelines in case you need to adjourn a game. If a game is not finished in the end of the time prescribed for play, the arbiter shall require the player having the move to seal the move. The player must write his move in unambiguous notation on his score sheet, put the score sheet and that of his opponent in the envelope, seal the envelope, and only then stop the clock. Wait, what? Really? You must write your move. Put your score sheet and the opponent's score sheet in an envelope, seal the envelope, and only then stop the clock. Um, um, up to then, the player retains his right to change his sealed move. Okay, that's pretty funny. Um, should be indicated on the envelope. The names of the players, the position immediately before the sealed move, the time used by each player, the name of the player who sealed the move, and the name of the sealed move, the number of the sealed move, the offer of a draw, if the proposal is current, and the date, time, and venue of the presumption of play. Um, arbiter shall check the accuracy of the information on the envelope and is responsible for its safekeeping. If a player proposes a draw offer, after he sealed the move, the offer remains valid. Um, before the game is to be resumed, the position immediately before the sealed move shall be set up on the chessboard, and the times used by each player when the game is adjourned shall be indicated by the clocks. I don't understand why you'd offer a draw unless you're damn sure of it. Like, if your opponent wants to, out of turn, offer a draw to you, and it's their move to do so, that would make more sense to me. Um, but I can tell you, if I'm adjourning a game, and my opponent might be thinking about it overnight, I'm not going to offer a draw, because this just emboldens the opponent, unless I am 100% certain the position is drawn, or unless I feel so motivated that I really don't want to come back the next day, to res or whenever, to resume the game. Um... But yeah, in general, it probably makes sense to um, not offer the draw if you're trying to win, or if you're trying to draw, even. You might ask your opponent, would you be so kind as to offer me a draw? Can we get this over with? Do we really want to resume this? But you can't really be the one offering the draw if it's your... I mean, that's kind of 
antiquated given that people analyze games overnight which is kind of rude but they do it anyway um, prior to the assumption of the game it's agreed drawn if one of the players notifies the arbiter of the designs that concludes the game what if both players notify the arbiter of a resignation um, that would be kind of weird wouldn't it except in the cases mentioned that the game is lost by a player um, it was recording the sealed move is ambiguous. I wonder how often that's happened. Or, as recorded, such as true significance is impossible to establish. Or it's an illegal move. So if you seal a bad move, either because it's ambiguous, or it's an illegal move, or nobody can figure out what you're saying, um, uh, or its true significance is impossible to establish. What are all the ways that could happen, I wonder? Um, it seems like a pretty funny rule. Its true significance is impossible to establish. Oh, I get it. So ambiguous would mean there are multiple ways to parse this. C would refer to it's an illegal move. You sealed a move that can't be executed. B would be, you sealed something that isn't really a chess move. Um, or, well, no, it's not ambiguous. It's just not a chess move. Or it might be illegal, or it might be ambiguous, or I don't know. Um, well, no. Ambiguous would mean that if there are multiple ways to interpret it, and... There are multiple valid ways to interpret it. C would be there are no valid ways to interpret it. B would be um, you wrote something that's not a chess move. Uh, or it falls somewhere outside of, like, it could be either an ambiguous, it could either be ambiguous or be illegal or just, like, you know, it's just not something that's... The move needs to be unambiguous, and it needs to be legal. And if there is a reasonable way the Arbiter can interpret what you've sealed, then it's considered unambiguous and legal. And the Arbiter, again, can have the help of the National Federation and, and even FIDE helping trying to figure out how to rule on a given incident. If at the agreed resumption time the player having to reply to the sealed move is present, the envelope is opened, the sealed move is made on the chessboard, and the clock started. If the player having to reply is not present, the clock shall be started. Upon his arrival, the player may stop the clock and summon the arbiter. The envelope is then opened and the sealed move made on the chessboard, then starting the clock. Um, or restarting the clock. The player who sealed the move is not present. His opponent has the right to record his reply on the score sheet, seal his score sheet in a fresh envelope, stop his clock, and start the absent player's clock instead of making his reply in the normal manner. If so, the envelope shall be handed to the arbiter for safekeeping and open on the absent player's arrival. Yeah, adjournments are weird. They sound kind of fun, because, like, you have the ability to play a chess game and then enjoy something other than the chess and then come back at a more convenient time to resume the game. Anyway, just having like a little break from the chess action could be a nice thing, I think. Only because I come from a culture where we have these kind of like lots of games in one day or one weekend. I kind of thrive on that, but also you don't get to see very much if you're doing that. And the idea of having an adjournment sounds kind of pleasant to me. If it allows you to go out and see the city or whatever. Uh, the player shall lose the game if he arrives at the chessboard more than an hour late uh, for the resumption of an adjourned game, unless the rules or the arbiter decide otherwise. However, the player who made the sealed move is the late player. The game is decided otherwise. Um, if the absent player has won the game, through checkmate. Wait, what? Uh, 
Oh, so if he sealed a checkmate move. Okay. <laughs> I guess that could happen. Um, yeah, if the Arbiter required you to seal a move and you didn't protest it and say, okay, you could accidentally seal a checkmate move or seal it on purpose. Well, that's that's too good. You declare that, like, we're going to meet tomorrow to finish this. And then you've sealed a checkmate move. Uh, and it is indeed checkmate. Um, kind of sucks for your opponent, then, that they, like... I mean, they should have resigned, you know? But it's just very unfortunate that only one player has to resume the game in that instance. Um... Absent player has produced a drawn game by virtue of the fact that this... Uh, I mean... Yeah, that's just a really weird circumstance that that could happen in 10A. Or the absent player has produced a drawn game uh, through stalemate or through a position there neither player can win. Neither player can checkmate by any series of legal moves. Or... Um, player present has lost the game according to article 6.9 that's kind of weird hey welcome we're just catching up on the rules of chess because you know they only take a minute to learn uh, we're going through the international rule set just to because those are easier than the US chess rules uh, we're going to catch up on those in just a minute so rule 6.9, um, for purposes of resuming from an adjournment, 6.9 is... Oh goodness, where was that? Um, if a player does not complete the moves in the allotted time. That's what I thought. Um, so yeah, if a flag falls after an adjournment, that concludes the game. That's just pretty cool. Um, yeah, let's go back to... We're skipping the rapid play rules because those are uh, specific to FIDE. Um, and they're kind of different in the U.S. Chess Federation. All right. So we're on rule 12 here, I think. Oh, no, rule 10. Um, so if you produced a drawn game by virtue of the stalemate or by virtue of the fact that it's um, not possible for the opponent to win or if the player present to the board has lost the game by running out of time or drawn the game by running out of time, uh, that concludes the game too. Otherwise, the player absent uh, loses. If the envelope containing the sealed move is missing, the game shall continue from the position with the clock times recorded at the time of adjournment. If the time used by each player cannot be reestablished, the arbiter shall set the clocks, and the player who sealed the move makes the move he stated he states that he sealed on the chessboard. If it's impossible to reestablish a position, a game is annulled, and a new game must be played. That sounds like something that could happen in a chess movie. That, like, you're going to seal the move for, uh, in order to resume it the next day, and somebody steals the envelope, and it becomes somehow impossible to reestablish the position, and they just have to play a new game. Uh, I'm like 1900-something, both the U.S. rating and FIDE. So I'm okay. I understand some of these rules, but there's some things we've been learning here as we've been plowing through it. If upon resumption of the game, either player points out, before making his first move, that the time used has incorrectly been indicated on either clock, this error must be corrected. If the error is not established, the game continues without correction unless the arbiter feels the consequences will be too severe. Uh, duration of each resumption session shall be controlled by the arbiter's timepiece. Um, the starting time and finishing time shall be announced in advance. Alright, so 
those are the international chess rules. The FIDE laws of chess. Now, how, let's see, how far are we into this stream? Because we haven't gotten to the U.S. rules yet. These are the international rules. Um, no, I'd say this is way more interesting because there's tons of potential for conflict. Um, all right, so USCF rules of chess. Let's see if I can find this because I've tried on numerous occasions. I've struggled. I mean, you could always go like, yeah, you can go purchase the book from the U.S. Chess Sales Web Store. That seems to be the way to get the U.S. Chess Rulebook. Um, otherwise, you can like see these are the changes from the um, this edition of the rulebook. There's the changes to the fifth edition. There's the changes to the sixth edition. But uh, I seem to have a very difficult time. Like USCF, there's rulebook changes, rulebook changes. Here's how you play chess. Here's how the pieces move. Here's a special moves. Castling and en passant. Promotion apparently isn't very special. And um, yeah, that's... Um, and then, so, like, there's the deviations to the rules. Uh, but, yeah, if you want the rules to U.S. chess, um, you need to purchase the rule book. Um, for, on a bridge, this, uh, to visit the store. So I click the link. And you can sign up for exclusive deals and offers, you know? Um, you know, somebody should actually call in. You know, it'd be great if somebody called in during the next, um, what's it, the U.S. Chess Championship. And just ask, um, you know, I don't have the money to purchase the rule book. How do I learn the rules of chess that we use in the U.S.? I don't feel like spending 20 books on a rule book, however fantastic. And I have gone to libraries, and libraries do stock these, and these are great. But I don't feel like paying 20 bucks to learn how to play a game that I already know how to play. Um, that's my opinion. And, I mean, I've met this author. He's a wonderful person. He runs excellent tournaments. I'm just not going to put... I'm, it's an excellent rule book. I've actually read through older editions of it. But I don't feel like paying 20 bucks to pay, read a 416-page rule book about how to play U.S. chess. Um, I'm sorry, but like that's not what I'm there to play chess for. Um players who have been around a while probably have read um, various editions of the rules or have gained things through experience. Uh, I mean, yeah, you could pirate it, but piracy is not a good thing either. So, I would... It would be actually kind of interesting to ask, you know, just call in during the U.S. championships and ask them, you know, how do I learn the rules to this game? Because I don't feel like spending 20 books... I don't feel like reading a 416-page rule book, however perfect that book is. And the book, I've read previous editions of it. It's a very high-quality publication. This author writes excellent columns. But with all due respect, something... We should try to elevate our standards beyond where it's currently at. But that's my own personal opinion. Nothing against the author. He does a wonderful job conducting tournaments. All his chess columns are perfect um, in the USCF blog. Um, but, I mean, I just don't get it. I, I just... Anyway, 
players who have been around a while know more or less what the U.S. chess rules are. They used to be available in PDF form, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Opinions may differ on that stuff, too. So... Uh, since the 5th edition, there have been some USCF policy changes about scholastic chess. I'm not going to read scholastic rules, but you can go to the USCF website to learn more about the scholastic stuff. Um, a change to the official rules of chess requires a two-thirds vote by the Board of Delegates to become effective. There's ratings about rules about ratings and rating floors and... Um, electronic communication devices. I remember they had to change the rules around the time that like they were also doing a promotion with the Monroy and things. Uh, the official rules actually conflicted with the use of the Monroy device. And it was just really weird at that time. But um, again, I could be misinterpreting things. I'm sorry if I am, but this is just how I seem to have remembered it. Maybe my re recollection's incorrect, or maybe the rules might have been changed in a timely fashion. I don't remember. Um, the one versus two pairing rule change. Da, 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 um, changes for 2014. Opening paragraph was replaced regarding advice received during a game. Wait, so this doesn't even include the rules. This tells you which rules were changed, but not what the changes were in anything other than a summary form. Okay, that's pretty great. Um, paragraph 2 in Rule 5a has been replaced with new wording, reflects some of the changes in the new language. Oh, yeah, yeah. How do you follow this stuff? Okay, so this is the 5th edition rule changes. Um... It's possible for a director to function only as a witness and not as an arbiter. That's great. Um, some wording was removed, so USCF rules were aligned with their FIDE counterparts, namely that vertical castling is illegal. Um, let's see, rule 5FA, subtracting time for using a delay clock. I remember around the time that change was made, so... Um, all clocks are set to the same base time, and if you forget to set the delay, that's just tough luck. You don't increment. You don't have, like, game in one hour without delay, game in 55 minutes plus 5 second delay otherwise. Use the same base time regardless of whether or not you have a delay. And if you have a delay, use it, um, are the rules, if I understand correctly. Uh, there's a claim for insufficient losing chances, an additional variation that does not need to be announced in advance that allows for the non-enforcement of Rule 14H. No claim of insufficient losing chances and sudden death. Um, so you don't need to announce in advance a non-enforcement of insufficient losing chances. So this is 2011. Um when that rule for allowing insufficient losing chances was introduced into the rule book, three years later it was made effective that that rule is optional. That the director does not need to enforce an insufficient losing chances claim. Um, and they furthermore do not need to announce it in advance that it's not being enforced. Because insufficient losing chances was a freaking mess. Uh, I've never had to claim it. There was one Blitz game back in high school where I was playing under USCF where I actually should have claimed it, um, but instead I just forced uh, a draw um, with only a few seconds left on my clock. But I've never seen a need to enforce that rule. Um, I think the FIDE rules are much cleaner anyway, and as of 2014, this ILC is no more, or at least it's optional to not enforce the rule. Um, and then they have TD Tips, which have been published throughout the years, I think mostly encouraged by Tim Just, pushing the rules in a more consistent 
easier to enforce manner, some ways that are more amenable to both players and tournament directors. So Tim Just has done an excellent, excellent job shepherding the rules in a positive direction, as best as I understand. Uh, okay, uh, FIDE title and rating tournaments. Yeah, whatever. Um, limited prizes, special clocks for handicapped players are exempt from Rule 16b. Delay clock is preferable in sudden death. Um, outlines the procedure for replacing an analog clock with either a delay or an increment clock. Um, back in high school, I tried to claim um, that I needed a delay clock under this rule. Um, TD denied my claim. Um, so it's complicated. Um, but yeah, I think 42D, it's, oh my God, this is page three of 38. Are these not, are these just the deviations from the rules? Okay. Yeah, we're never getting through this. And this is just the 2014 changes to the rule book. Uh, all changes. Complete text. Okay, there's... But this is without the original text. This is just the changes to the text. Um, okay. Yeah, this is, like, impossible to understand. Um, and I do think, though, that Tim Justin such has, uh, yeah, just make this a Lambda Calculus reading stream, because that would make more sense than trying to read this. This particular document is not easy to read. Let's just skip ahead to the changes to the 6th edition rulebook. Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, here we are. Here's the interesting rule change that took place recently. Uh, claim of insufficient losing chances in a sudden death time control. It's not applicable for games in which a clock is being used with a time delay or increment. Whether the game begins with such a clock or one is added during the game, if such a clock is not being used or such a clock is being used without the time delay in uh, question, then this procedure is available. That is what I was contesting, is that um, I had a position where um, it was, the position was symmetric. Like, there was no way either of us could, well, whatever. Uh, I'm being a little biased in my own perspective. I don't need to go into my own little silly worries. In a sudden attack control, Player with two minutes or less may re um, request to have a draw um, under insufficient losing chances, but you cannot request to change the clock. You can only request ILC, and it's the tournament director who may choose to allow you to have resume the game, um, possibly with a delay clock, but it's at the TD's discretion as to whether your ILC claim has any basis. Um, so, yeah. Um, no claim of ILC in sudden death. Um, so if you're in sudden death, you cannot claim ILC. Oh, sorry, that was the original rule. Um, as opposed to what? Resolution of 14H claim. Don't consider the ratings of the player. Um, that makes sense. No claim in sudden death. Yeah, what happened to this? Whatever happened to rule 14H6? Are there modifications to this rule?
Um, all right. If the claim is unclear and the delay clock is available, you use the delay clock. If the claim is unclear and the delay clock is not available, um, deny the claim while inviting a later reclaim. There's no adjustment of either player's time after a claimant's clock is started. The 14H draw request by the claimant becomes a draw under 14B3. Um, Penalties for infractions should be standard, etc. Watch the game, reserving judgment on the claim. So they continue the game. Um, if the claim is clearly correct, um, then it's considered drawn. But what does that mean of Rule 14H6, where it says ILC claims cannot be used? I guess that just means in general you cannot use 14H6 anymore. Um, um, no claim of insufficient losing chances and sudden death will be allowed. This variation, oh, this variation. This is a variation on the rule that allows the TD at their discretion without announcing it in advance. Um, but if prompted, they should tell you that this is the rule they're playing by, but they don't have to announce in advance. But it's a variation that's acceptable that ILC is denied. So it actually falls on the player to ask, prior to the event, what is your take on ILC and are you enforcing it in this event? Okay, that's good to know. I should ask that at every USCF tournament. Should ask that about the US chess championships, except that doesn't really matter because they're playing with a delay clock. So ILC is not um, considered in that circumstance. But also, no, those are playing under USCF rules, of course, not under FIDE rules. Um, I think. Um. Okay, and then yeah, 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 you can't solicit help from other people. And you're not allowed to uh, leave the playing venue without the arbiter's permission. Um, can't make a lot of noise. The tournament director must not only be absolutely objective, but also must be able to devote full attention to directing duties. Um, it's common practice for the director to play, um, but no, you have to remain objective and have to be able to conduct your duties. Um, one versus two pairings. Uh, yeah. So there's a FIDE title tournament, etc., etc. There's ways of scoring events. I'm not so concerned with how pairings are done and such. I just want to play the game. There's, uh, in sudden death, you prefer to have a delay clock. Um, you prefer to have an increment clock if you have an increment time control. There's recommended ways of using the increment clock. Uh, there should be score sheets. I think this is when they had Monroy's. I could be mistaking this with the later edition of the rules. I don't remember. There's TD certification rules. Um, let's see. Uh, you see if round robin tournament of eight or more player rated entrants, the mean rating of at least 1,800 um, is a category R tournament. Who knew? What's this? Um, it's kind of... I didn't know they had all these special category tournaments. That's kind of cool. Um, for the first three-year term, oh, no testing requirement for the first three-year term for the club director. Each three-year term thereafter, um, an objective test of moderate difficulty that must be passed at a 70% level. 
There's local director experience requirements, testing requirements, limitations, a senior director requirements. Basically, if you're going to become a tournament director, you have to learn a lot of stuff, and it's a big thing. You have an associate national director uh, requirements, national tournament director, international and FIDE arbiter requirements. Then there's the rating system. And what else do I want to learn? Internet chess. Um, yeah, that's cool. The chief assistant TD is available, is able to witness. The computer screen is visible, each player in game while games are in progress. This means that each site is connected for a play. An assistant is appointed to aid the chief TD in ensuring the laws are uh, followed. Though not required, it's advisable that the same software be used on both sides of the game. Um, timekeeping, touch move, completed moves, software, chess interfaces vary widely on touch moves. In most cases, a move is not transmitted until a legal move is released on the board. Uh, this time of transmittal is considered the touch. Mouse slips. Occasionally, the mouse transmitted is not the intended move. The on-site TD may verify unintentional mouse slip rejection of a transmitted move. Um, so, yeah, they give examples. Alternate rule for mouse slips. No appeal is allowed. If mouse slips occur, to, uh, refer to paragraph one of the section. Yeah, basically just don't mouse slip, because that sucks. Um, it occurs to me actually it'd be best that you type in the moves, although then people could typo the moves. So what do you do? It's best to actually play with some sort of actual chessboard hooked up to the computer if possible. That's my own opinion. Um, oh jeez, what's this? What is this? What's this big block of USCF blitz rules? Um, you and I know how USCF blitz rules work. Um, the player with the black pieces chooses the standard timer. If there are multiple standard timers to choose among, uh, black just the player with the black pieces gets to choose what timer to use. Uh, player may straighten the clock, may set the clock upright if it was knocked over. Um, if a clock is not ticking, you may uh, press his side down and then repress your side. If it fails, call a director. Uh, each player must always be allowed to press the clock. You can't get in the way of your opponent pressing the clock. You cannot hover over the clock. Um, players won uh, by a player who checkmates, whose opponent resigns, whose opponent's flag falls first, whose opponent who after an illegal move is completed by the opponent, um, then takes the king. Uh, an illegal move doesn't negate the player's right to claim on time. Pride is done. <laughs> oh, okay. If these are done simultaneously, wow, if, both, if one player claims that the opponent made an illegal move, and the opponent claims you ran out of time, the player who made the illegal move loses. As it should be. All right, and then yeah, rules for drawing. ILC claims are not allowed in Blitz. Interesting little statement for those people familiar with internet chess and saying that should work the same way as US rules. As of 2014, US chess rules do not allow for insufficient losing chances in Blitz time controls. Um, just saying. So actually, those, um, there used to be allowment for insufficient losing chances rules under USCF time controls, even in Blitz. Uh, uh, however, as of 2014, that's been nixed. Um, so that's revisions to the fifth edition of the US Chess rulebook. Uh, somewhere here I've got the 6th edition U.S. Chess Rulebook of Revisions. So, let's see. Yeah, here's Rulebook Changes 
2018 revisions to the sixth edition. Let's zoom in on this a bit so we can all read this together. Uh, changes have been made in U.S. chess policy and the wording of the rules blows a collection of those changes. Any additions or corrections can be sent to U.S. chess. Um, please note these policy changes are different than rules changes and occur more than once per year. This is scholastic policy change. Um, again, I'm not paying too much attention to that, even though that's a large section of how U.S. chess operates. I'm not getting myself too invested in that particular aspect of the game. New as of April 1, 2016, rating floors. That the money floors may be set reset to 4,000 for the various levels. Um, that any player retroactive to that who's um, earned between those amounts and was given a money floor may be reset back to their actual achieved rating um, and that subsequent tournaments be re-rated. For FIDE rated events in the US, uh, for non-NOR events the chief TD must be a senior TD. Uh, for FIDE norm events the chief TD must be FA or IA. If it's acceptable for a FIDE only rated event in the USA to have a chief arbiter that is not a US chess member nor a US chess TD. Um, and for all FIDE rated events registered by the Office of FIDE, they must be an appropriately licensed arbiter listed as chief tournament director. Um, US Chess will charge a $60 administrative fee for US Chess affiliates to all FIDE rated events, a $40 discount off the administrative fee if it submits a FIDE rated event prepared. Da, 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 da. Okay. So there's fees for those running the events, which who is not me? I'm not the one running events. Uh, require any FIDE rated events to be submitted using a pairing program that's compatible with FIDE requirements and a FIDE general data exchange format, also known as the Kraus format. After that date, any events not submitted in accordance with these standards will not be submitted for FIDE rating and will instead be returned to the submitting affiliate who must then resubmit them in the proper format. Um, that's cool. Uh, good faith deposit increased to 50. For what? Oh, okay, whatever. Um, pawn promotion. New wording makes the procedure of promoting a pawn clearer. Now the pawn is considered touched and must be promoted uh, to the unreleased piece touching the promotion square. Wording change. Uh, once the piece off the board touches the promotion square, the pawn must be promoted to that piece. So this is taking some inspiration from FIDE here, and for the better. Giving the buy to a higher rated player, a variation that need not be in advance. Um, this allows assigning the buy to a higher rated player rather than lower rated player in the score group in order to improve, achieve, uh, improve color assignments for the entire group. Hey, welcome. We're just having some fun reading the rules. It'll only take just a minute. Uh, there's another unannounced variation for team pairings. Um, okay, and then there's rules about the U.S. Chess Code of Ethics. TD, a TD tip was added regarding FIDE and U.S. Chess dual certification and TD certification requirements. A round robin requirement changed from eight players um, to six players. Uh, illegal move in the last 10 moves, and we're just, yeah, okay, just don't make illegal moves, people, and try to get them corrected, and do things in a reasonable way, and the TD will help you all out if, if something weird happened, um, but yeah, behave reasonably, that's a big rule book, nobody's going to read it other than the TD, and the TD is not going to probably not going to read it, though they will have to go through testing to make sure they have a mastery of the material. Only players, only the TDs at the very highest level will have read the entire book anyway, but they all have it as a reference manual. Uh, let's see. Um, da -da. Both players must have the same time control. You cannot have time... 
Um, time odds games are not uh, rateable. Uh, recommended increment or delay. Yeah, okay. So this talks about which sections were adjusted. Um, let's see. Do the actual changes themselves appear? Oh, and these are revisions to older versions of the text. Um, so that's cool. And then there's U.S. Chess rules changes. All right, here we are in detail. The organizers to indicate the full time control. Uh, game 90, increment 30, etc., etc. This must be ter specified in the TLAs, and um, etc. You can't just it's like say I'm going to run a tournament and then not tell people what the time control is. Um, it is or also you can't write it one way in the TLA and then run it differently during the event. It's acceptable for abbreviated publicity to refer the reader to more complete tournament details which are posted elsewhere. Uh, both players have to use the same time control, recommended increment or delay for a mixed or repeating time control for a base time of 30 minutes or more, an increment or delay in the range of 5 to 30 seconds is recommended. For a base time of 10 or more minutes in less than 30 minutes, or an increment of 3 seconds is recommended for a base time of 10 minutes or less, an increment or delay of 2 seconds is recommended. So under 10, two or more seconds, or I'm sorry, two second delay or increment is recommended. More than 10 minutes, uh, less than 30, an increment or delay of three is recommended. More than 30, um, somewhere in the range of five to 30 seconds is recommended. That's for over the board play. Um, organizer fails to specify an increment or delay um, the minimum recommended delay specified in Rule 5e shall apply in that case. Um, okay, if there's not an increment clock available, you can use a delay capable clock. Um, you don't have those available, use a digital clock without delay capability. Otherwise, use an analog clock. Um, let's see, variation. Variations on clocks being available and not available. Generally speaking, you can find somebody who's got a digital clock of some sort. Players should understand how to set the clock, and they should not rig the clock. Um, a piece touches the promotion square that decides which piece is going to move. Um, if you touch the rook first, the castling is not allowed. Maybe chess 960 rules are different, but who plays chess 960 anyway? Uh, illegal move in the first 10 moves. Um, positions should be reinstated to what was before the illegal move. The players do not recover the time used after the illegal move. You shall then continue by applying rule 10, the touch piece. If do, the position cannot be reinstated, then the illegal move shall stand. Move counters on clocks, etc., etc. Illegal moves in time pressure. Um, Let's see, uh, we don't have a delay of 30 seconds or more, or an increment of 30 seconds or more. Directors shall not, or should not, call attention to illegal moves and time pressure. Only the players may make the claim an illegal move occurred. If during the game of time pressure, players claim that one of either player's last two moves was illegal as upheld by the TD, the position shall be reinstated to what's before the illegal move. And then the procedure for touch move will be followed uh, with no adjustment to the time on the clocks. I'm pretty sure 11A is touch move. What else would make sense in that context? Or, I don't know. You tell me. Um, except in time pressure situation, a director who witnesses an illegal move shall require the player to um, replace that move with a legal move. This um, this seems suspect. Because how do you know if the TD observed and knew the move was illegal? I don't know. 
That seems pretty suspect to me. FIDE rules seem a bit clearer there. And then we got rules about both flags being down in sudden death. You all know this stuff. I don't need to go over it. And if you don't know it, feel free to look it up. But um, common sense applies if both flags are down. Um, but it's also, just don't get into that situation. If your opponent's flag falls, stop the clock and immediately claim it. Um, there's going to be disputes anyway. Uh, yeah. So, 14H6 allowed um, a variation where ILC was not to be enforced. Um, editor's note, 14K Increment Games was deleted because it has the same essential wording that you found elsewhere in the 6th edition. However, the concept that ILC does not apply in Increment Games still applies. That is to say, 14K... Um, the original 14K section was redundant because 14H6 um, made it, it possible for TD to make a tournament and not have to declare in advance that ILC did not apply. Okay, director declares a draw for lack of progress. If one or both of the t curses of TD may claim it drawn, the same position has occurred for at least five consecutive alternate moves by each player. So that's a U.S. rule. I haven't seen that one in the FIDE rule book. That seems to just be a U.S. rule. And any consecutive series of 75 moves has been completed by each player without the movement of any pawn and without any capture. If the last move resulted in checkmate, that still takes precedence. Well, what if there's a stalemate? Huh? How about that? You're thinking about... No, okay. <laughs> I guess it doesn't matter there, does it? Um... Special rules for time pressure. Yeah, I wonder if there's a circumstance where it matters. Um, like, stalemate immediately ends the game, so this 14k2 does not apply. I, I'm pretty sure this about checkmate didn't even need to be said, but it's said anyway. Special rules for time pressure. Players don't have to record moves until after the time control. If you want to make a claim that your opponent lost on time, you have to uh, have a complete score sheet. Illegal moves and time pressure. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's rules about blitz and illegal moves. Then there's rules here about illegal moves and time pressure. Uh, new rule addressing the procedures to when to use increment or delay is not set. Uh, if delay or increment clock is used in an event, that da 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 da. Uh, so, how you fix the game, how you interrupt a game, what do you do if illegal moves do occur, you can write appeals within seven days of the end of the tournament. Um, and they will be considered at the discretion of the committee hearing the appeal. The executive director shall from time to time review and set the required deposit amount in cons consultation with the committees and handle appeals. Um, giving the buy to a higher rated player can be done for purposes of balancing the colors. Uh, otherwise, ordinarily, the buy would go to the low rated player in a section. Um, Team pairings can take precedence over color equalization, uh, so you don't pair players from the same team. Um, no winner shall receive more than one cash award. The award shall be one full cash prize. Uh, any other special prizes should be announced and designated as such. So you can only win one cash prize. Um, this can make distributing prizes pretty complicated. You can have ties for prizes. Um, you know, no player shall receive more than one trophy or plaque, etc. No player shall receive more than one non-cash prize um, or one mon monetary prize. Um, 
Let's see, standard clocks, delay clocks, increment clocks are preferable. The code of ethics, you know, because in order to play a chess game, you need some ethics. Now, um, this is interesting. It's good that they put this forward, just as a formality. What have we learned so far? Uh, I think, like, the pawn goes forward two squares or something. No, we've actually made it through quite a few rules at this point. Um, we're halfway through the revisions to the sixth rule book that take effect this year. Uh, purpose of the Code of Ethics set forth standards with which the conduct of players, tournament directors, sponsors, and other individuals and entities participating in the affairs of the USCF, including tournaments and other activities sponsored or sanctioned by USCF, should conform or specify sanctions for conduct that do not conform to such standards and to specify the procedures by which alleged violations are to be investigated and, if necessary, the appropriate sanctions imposed. Some of you might recall some things that happened with the U.S. Chess Federation some number of years ago. I don't need to dredge them up, but it's good that they have these rules now in place, albeit the timing of this is... Uh, well, it would have been nice to have this in the first place. These are not equivalent to criminal laws and procedures. Rather, they concern the rights and privileges of U.S. chess membership, including but not limited to the privilege of participating in tournaments, events, or other activities as a member of U.S. chess. Standards, procedures, and that 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 members of U.S. chess, act, people acting in some capability uh, as officers of U.S. chess. Each member and participant shall be found by this code of ethics, or bound by this code of ethics. There's the ethics committee, there's standards of conduct. So don't intentionally break the rules, don't cheat, don't lose games for payment, don't misrepresent your playing ability, um, in order to compete in division that was not, who's intended for other players. Uh, don't participate under a false name or falsified rating. Don't participate under suspension. Don't give false information to circumvent any rule or regulation. And don't attempt to interfere with the rights of chess members. Um, uh, violating the laws is obviously a bad thing, too. Um, any U.S. chess member may initiate procedures under this code by filing a complaint to the Ethics Committee in the event that any accusation does not fall clearly under the standards of conduct above the Ethics Committee. You'll have the authority to decide whether the alleged conduct is within the scope of the uh, Code of Ethics. In the case of uh, each alleged violation that is within the scope of the Code of Ethics, the following steps shall occur. Factual inquiry will be made when issuing decision. The Ethics Committee will provide a rationale. Uh, appropriate sanctions shall be recommended uh, to the executive board. Uh, the executive board is the one makes executes the decisions. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, except as specified in 7F, uh, sanctions recommended shall be deemed final unless appealed to the executive board by the person or persons um, upon whom the sanctions have been imposed, or upon the initiative of any member of the executive board. So you can't have some third party person appeal this. Only the sanctioned person or members of the executive board may appeal a decision. And there's a timeline for appealing, or there's a deadline for appealing those things. Upon repeal, review of the facts and the appropriateness of the recommendation, it should be undertaken by the executive board. If the person with whom sanctions, wait, wait, upon appeal, okay, shall be undertaken. It's not that the executive board may undertake, that the executive board shall uh, consider appeals. If the person against whom sanctions have been recommended is a member of the board, he or she may not appeal the sanctions to the executive board, but may appeal to the U.S. Board of Delegates at its next scheduled meeting. If any member of the Ethics Committee or the U.S. Executive Board has a conflict of interest 
the person may not act in the capacity of the committee or board member in that case. And sanctions involve recommendation or reprimands, uh, censure. Um, let's see. Uh, I forget exactly what censure means. I should remember what that means. Um, I guess that's suspension. Well, no, reprimandation is a penalty. Um, there's censure, which is a suspension. There's a suspended sentence with a probation. Oh, wait. No, what does censure mean? Let me look this up. Define censure. I think that just means removal from, well, no, it's not the same as suspension. Um, oh, expression of disapproval. Okay. Uh, so you can be reprimanded. You can be censured for a more serious offense. You can have a suspended sentence with the probation could be flat out suspended um, without probation. Um, okay, it's can be expelled and you can be excluded from events. Again, this is not a legal body. This is just US chess. The person being sanctioned is a member of the board. The ethics committee may recommend to the executive board no sanctions other than censure or reprimand, but may also recommend other reactions to the board of delegates. Um, there's a lot of rules here, aren't there? I think U.S. Chess Federation's learned a few things from its experiences. Um, this case of every sanction that involves suspension or expulsion, a member may not hold any office. Um, and the U.S. Chess Business Office shall be informed in writing of all official determinations of the Ethics Committee. Uh, TD certification rules, um, more TD rules, categories, more categories, limitations, limitations, titles. U.S. chess rating system that people are so vehement about understanding and so forth. Um, I've actually read through all the ratings rules and how it all works. It's not particularly exciting, um, but it, I don't know. There have been just so many adjustments to the rating rules. Um, okay, so what's this here? The game is a draw, etc., etc. Wait. These are blitz rules. Okay. Um, whoever correctly points out the f opponent's flag has fallen first. Um, that is to say, not who has first pointed out that the flag has fallen, but was correctly pointed out that the opponent's flag was the first to fall. Um, uh, if you have mating material. That's a win. Player moves his king adjacent to the opponent's king and then attempts to claim a win. Under this rule, shall lose the game. <laughs> okay, that's ridiculous. Really? We needed a rule just for that? That's funny. At least it's unambiguous. You gotta have... But my goodness, TD's gonna have fun learning that one. You can't put the kings adjacent to each other. I don't think I've ever seen anybody try to do that. Um, in the same way, I've never seen a tournament where a queen has not been available for promotion. Um, you've not had to summon a tournament director or an arbiter to go find a queen. Come on. Um, oh, here it is. Rule 16. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Standard penalty for a first offense is to add one minute to the opponent's clock. Uh, repeated offenses, etc., could be left at the discretion of the tournament director. TD tip 
illegal moves for any reason lose instantly if correctly claimed. The one minute penalty does not apply to illegal moves in Blitz. A uh, standard penalty of one minute applies to other Blitz rules infractions, such as failure to follow touch move rules or whatever. Um, TD decisions are fo Wait, really? Wow. Oh, that is great. In Blitz time control, the TD can do whatever they want? Really? Um... TD could get in hot water for doing that, but their decision's final. Okay, well, remind me not to play in USCF Blitz tournaments. I'm just saying. Not, I can't play fast enough for it anyway, but that's funny. Um, yes, there's what these are what the time controls are. Eh, stuff about the sealed envelope missing. Eh, whatever. How often have you had to seal a game for adjournment anyway? Just asking. Alright. Um, multiple US chess ratings. If a player with an old established rating of 1900 is er erroneously started over a 1700 over f based on five games, the rating should be used as a 1900 across five games, or 1860. Okay, whatever. It's not going to happen often. Um, the U.S. Chess rating system. Materials a mix of ever-changing rating formulas, ratings policies, and rules changes. It does not reflect the exact system used to calculate ratings. Rather, it demonstrates the ideas behind the rating system. <sighs> okay. Thankfully, there are documents that are freely available that document how the current rating system works. But that's not to say that's how it's always worked. Um, let's see, there's rating floors, entire events being rated, uh, other considerations. The entire official list are published by the rating supplement every month and used for pairing prize and wall chart purposes. All right. US chess correspondence rules. I'm not actually using, I'm not playing US chess correspondence. I have played correspondence, just not through the US chess federation. Um, though maybe this is something I should consider doing at some point, but that's a lot of work and effort. And I'd rather devote that to other constructive aims. But if I choose to engage in uh, U.S. chess correspondence chess, um, I may uh, read up more closely about this. Uh, okay, and you can find your rating on uschess.org, uh, in the member services area. Um, it shows how your skill matches up against other chess players coast to coast. What about people in Hawaii? Are those people not on the web? Okay. No need to get all lawyery on this. Yeah, no, that's cool. Very nice. Very nice. So, I still complain that, like, uh, what right do I have to complain? If I want to do something constructive. I should make my own damn uh, federation. But I think it would be nice if um, rules could be expressed in a more succinct manner and agreed upon by everyone. But I think TDs are good people. I think players are good people. It's just this result. It's the best possible result that could have happened, but my god. A 416-page rulebook. I remember reading through this when it was like 200 pages. It was exciting stuff, really. Um, but, yeah, no, there's all kinds of events and rating categories and things to follow. And it's good that they have this documented so TDs and officials don't have to make up rules. And it's good so they know how to deal, in the case of lawsuits, they have ways of dealing with that. Um, it's just 
unfortunate that this is what resulted from that. Anyway, so we've read up on the uh, changes to the official chess rules. We've read up on um, the um, FIDE international chess rules. I think at this point we have a decent understanding of how chess works. Many people are still under a mistaken impression about the insufficient losing chances rule, 14H, which um, commonly by tournament directors under U.S. chess is practiced as 14H6 variation, where without prior announcement, ILC is no longer enforced. Um, that you can't just claim insufficient losing chances. They're, at least at the tournament director's discretion, they may elect not to enforce the insufficient losing chances rule because it sucks, uh, frankly. But, you know, um, I don't know, there's a lot of good rules in there. Such as the you can't move thing, you can't play a move with both hands. Not even a castling move. It used to be that you could play a castling move with both hands. Now you have to play it in a more dignified manner. This isn't like playing an online game. This is playing a dignified game between gentle persons. Anyway, so yeah, I think we've learned a thing or two about the rules of chess. Um, let's see, how did we do? It should only take a minute or two, they said. We've been here two hours, 22 minutes, but I think, I think we've learned some things. So I think I'm going to wrap it up there. It's been exciting, right? I promise we'll play games next time. It'll be fun. But yeah, if you've got questions, um, feel free to direct them to the U.S. Chess Federation, at least if you're a member. I'm sure they'd be more than glad to try to answer your questions or put you in the right direction. Um, probably suggesting that you go visit a library or go purchase their rule book. But um, also, if you like read the U.S. Chess Life magazine, you can read all these TD tips. The people who run the organization are all good people. They're all well intended. Um, and also, bear in mind, there is a U.S. Chess Federation election, um, which is terminating, or the votes are due by May 1st. So read up about who the candidates are, and I still have to do that. I'm going to do that. It'll be a good thing to do. Um, but yeah, these people representing our organization are good people, and now they have good rules to make sure that they get along with each other. And hopefully things will work out a lot better than they have in the past. So, it's exciting stuff. Um, so I guess that will conclude our section about reading chess rules. So, thanks for watching and discussing that. And I'll see you next time. And that's where I'm going to click the video. So.